going to deviate a little bit from the chain investigation stuff that's specific to looking at transaction data. Um, OK, yeah. All right, we're set to go. Just deciding where to start for today. So we have, um, I've been looking through a lot of articles recently that talk about different crypto projects that are being impacted by all of the stuff that's been happening to put pressure on the industry, you know, from job cuts to uh, new policy frameworks and regulator enforcement and things like companies deciding if they want to continue in the crypto space or if they want to uh, make exits or rebrand themselves, uh, even though they're, you know, undergoing bankruptcy court cases and being sued by former partners and stuff. So there's a lot of interesting conflict going on there where people are trying to continue to find a business model that makes sense. And one of the interesting things that I have found the past couple of weeks looking at the crypto market is that the exchanges are getting hit right now by uh, layoffs. So we've had a bunch of examples of this, and this ties in a lot to why are exchanges contracting in size? And part of that's going to be, I'm sure, that you know, there's less people, there's less demand for the market. So they've grown too quickly. They've got to shrink the size, lowest support costs, and then continue to do what they're doing. But a couple of exchanges have actually run into some serious issues recently um, with regulators. You know, we had the, I always say it wrong, but uh, BitSlotto or BitLotto, uh, the exchange that was recently sanctioned by the US government. And we're going to continue to see examples of that. And the one that I keep coming back to, because it's the largest, it has the most traffic, and I think the most indication for what's going to happen to the crypto industry is, is Binance. And I actually did a little bit of work on uh, charity projects in crypto. And this was, this was almost two years ago now. And at the time when I did this work, I was actually very familiar with Binance's charity project and all the other charity projects that existed from exchanges. And I'll give you an example of one that, uh, I hope this work, this link still works, I'm sure it probably does. But I, I went to every exchange's website that was a major exchange that uh, took a significant amount of volume and I could look through documentation on this. Basically, they each have kind of tax incentives where they you know, have a ESG portfolio um, to get PR in exchange for having a slight amount of their profit be turned over into nonprofits, and then they make it back on their taxes and they get good PR out of it. It's a pretty common thing in any corporate structure. But crypto, it's especially interesting because there's not a lot of documentation here to support that these entities are receiving the amounts that the exchanges claim they are giving. Um, and in a case of like Coinbase gives 1% of their transaction fees to this GiveWell program. Um, FTX had a charity as well. They actually had five. And it's called the FTX Foundation, which is a company that I think won't exist pretty soon if it hasn't already uh, dissolved. And things like FTX Climate, I'm sure this links don't work anymore. But you know, there's a bunch of ideas of how to basically be a business-to-business -business model where you sell people PR and marketing in exchange for taking their money and then turning it over into a nonprofit group and then making all these kind of ridiculous claims of what what's going on with that money and what the impact is of it. And it's, you know, it's just greenwashing. Like, but uh, in the case of Binance Charity, I think part, partly because of the way that East Asia markets do marketing, Binance Charity put out some really different numbers when I recorded this document um, than what's there now. When I went to archive.org to try to verify those numbers, they cleverly put the numbers up in such a way that archive.org didn't record them, but other people did. So. I'm going to look at the wallet addresses that I found and kept here in this old Google Doc. I actually copied and pasted this from a larger one that I didn't want to share all of. Um, but this is one of the Binance Charity wallets, which at the time that I did this had $75 million running through it. And the total fund from both their website and from some of the transaction data I saw claimed that 120, they had $125 million in Binance Charity. Um, but going to the website today looks very different. And this is where we get kind of the interesting disparity between what's going on that companies say and what might actually be going on. Uh, so the website's changed a lot. 
but they make these claims, they change the website, and then you go back and look at the old versions, and it's a little bit hard to reconcile what's going on with both. Um, this project in particular is run by a woman named Helen High, who did some work in Ethiopia. And Helen High actually has a, kind of a mixed reputation. She worked for the UN, so she, in theory, would have some qualifications to be working at a major charity organization that's global. And um, somebody actually made a documentary that a lot of people contest with claims in it about Helen High owning a shoe factory uh, chain in Ethiopia. So there's like footage of her walking around the factory and footage of workers talking about how great it is. And uh, later on, some of those workers were interviewed and uh, they they very strongly said that things were conditions were bad. Culture was bad. Uh, was pretty standard third world country labor operation. So it's really interesting how you can kind of dress stuff up, change the numbers around a little bit and spit out PR. Uh, if I'm going to look for a project here, I wanted to look for the Australia project, which when I recorded the number, Binance Charity claimed they had given just over 50%, just around around 50% of this $125 million fund. They said they gave Habitat Restoration Project in Australia $63 million. Restoring habitats. This is the number that is there now. Just over a million dollars. Or 55.49 BTC. With one recipient. Yeah. So, you know, this is why I'm curious about this stuff, right? Um, they also claim that Justin Sun gave a $3 million donation that nobody could later verify. Um, and that's where this also becomes a, a question of Binance owns Binance Smart Chain and BNB is a Binance exchange asset. So they could be doing things to make the data on this that is verifiable uh, really difficult to find. And I'm kind of curious if they've shown any evidence that they can alter data after it's been published, because that would really create a, a problem, right? It would, it would create a, a situation where they can change the network state. Um, and in theory, they, they shouldn't be able to do that. But first thing I noticed when I looked at how this data was being presented is that this isn't on BSC scan, it's on bnbchain.org. This, I mean, this is a link straight from their website, and this can only be viewed here. That's because it's a BNB specific transaction. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is going to come out in the court documentation about other exchanges, I'm sure. And one of those is going to be FTX. So I'm going to just for a second close out all this other stuff. And talk about some of the things that I found interesting as far as documentation goes. So when things are going stagnant in the crypto industry, um, whether or not you're in a growth period, you see periods where not a lot's going on. Media still has to report on stuff, right? So they do a lot of tracking on uh, documentation for different court cases, and sometimes that's very insightful. We know, for example, that FTX creditor list hasn't been leaked because the judge decided it wouldn't be, but it has been published. So there is some information about what the what the balance sheets looked like, who the customers were, how many there were. Um, their identities are redacted, but I'm certain they're making some errors that might make it possible to dock some of those customers later on as this court case proceeds. And I'm sure eventually some of these will come out because they've started to. Um, and in particular, I wanted to mention that Brenna Smith, who's someone I think does a really excellent job talking about cryptocurrency, wrote an article about uh, two of those credit two of those companies on a list of possible FTX creditors. They're always going to say we don't we're not we don't know for sure, but they filed a lawsuit five seconds after the list went up. That kind of thing. So take from that what you will. I'm looking at this for a list in particular. Um, filings are public. These don't tell me what I need to know yet, but eventually I'm going to compare this list to the things like the Celsius leak. And from that, you can, I think, derive some interesting transaction history that you, I think, can find if, if they give dates, times, and amounts. I think that should be doable.
I do want to mention this as well. So we had another sanction come out about like a couple of uh, <laughs> Russian uh, criminals, and I thought it might be fun to go through some of these addresses since I haven't peeked at them yet. But we'll we'll see if we're going to do that at the end. Go along here. I do think this is going to become important to immigrants to Binance, right? Because Signature Bank has done a lot of audits for exchanges that are showing really dubious behavior and have been for years. And this is all going to come back to what comes out in the FTX court case. And what do people come out and say publicly about this? What documents get leaked? How does it all pair together to give you information about the riskiness of different parts of the cryptocurrency market sectors? Um, so that's, I'm just so excited for that because I didn't expect it to kind of go this far. I thought, I thought um, this would kind of get quashed or just not be coming out so explicitly. So I'm happy to see that that's kind of progressing in a way that we'll get more information about hopefully soon. Let's skip through some of this. And yeah, we had another suspension I, I know i've been like harping on binance but there's a reason for it um they've had a lot of issues lately and before before ftx went down i didn't see a lot of press about this stuff coming out you'd see it as rumor or as unverified speculation you wouldn't see people writing articles with a lot of declarative sentences in them so it's reaching heights of suspicion that everybody's kind of, it's, it's kind of going mainstream which is nice to see and it's going to probably mean more regulatory scrutiny. Um, I know that Vitalik is currently, Vitalik Buterin is currently in Africa doing a tour down there. And I'm not certain of what he's doing down there. Um, I'm not certain of the purpose, but I, I'm kind of curious if some of these cryptocurrency companies that are going to be directly subject to U.S. regulatory pressure are looking for ways to kind of hedge their existence. You know distribute their assets outside of places that the US government could freeze them or you know put them in a courtroom for having them there. And I do think this is going to continue to be a big problem. But also in general, like when you're when you're looking for information on this stuff, scanning headlines is actually quite an easy way to do it. And that's part of why I show this. Um, also because it's a way to get new topical stuff that we can kind of go deeper on if we choose to. You know, things like political donations going from FTX to political candidates. Um, how are they getting that information? Well, the answer is it depends. Sometimes it's coming out explicitly from people involved. Sometimes there's financial documentation. Sometimes there's literally like a piece of paper that says I'm giving you this much money and here it is. And that comes out publicly. And you just kind of take what you can get and see if it's sufficient to find more information. Um, and I, I think this would have been an interesting case to maybe look at as well. Maybe not super interesting outside of just a case study example of how to do it. But when, uh, when Justin's son announced that they're going to be selling debt tokens for F, from FTX, allegedly, uh, with no proof of how this was supposed to work, they... they his company reneged on this a little bit, uh, I think because this was a bad, bad idea. And I mean, it's just strange. It's a bit weird. It's it's like uh, capitalizing on something, you know, that's bad that happens all the time. But to do it in this way seems not even particularly smart. So but this, this information is out there and you can track them burning this, these tokens and look at what the statements say versus what the reports are saying and what the transaction data says. It's just very, I don't know what to say about it other than it's a bit strange. Um, and I don't really have an interest in going into that in detail, but um, this is something that I admittedly didn't, didn't read. I found this pretty late in the day, but I would love to, this is kind of what I look for. I look for something that starts off with a suspicious thread. And then I get the token contract and I see who owns most of it and who moves assets pretty recently to when certain events happen. So 
I want to try to make these calls interesting from like a fundamental level. If you're if you're trying to do this stuff on your own, you don't have to do it through looking at just transaction data. You can do it from just media mining or looking at social media posts, right? Not limited to any particular angle that you want to look at the data from. Um, and if you don't want to do your own processing of that information, you can always use supplementary sources like Pectual Alerts, when I mentioned sometimes. The website I'm on right now is Protos, which is pretty pretty good about some of this stuff, especially condensing it and giving you information that tells you a lot of numbers. I am going to disclose some stuff that I don't know if I've ever talked about publicly here. Um, but I know quite a bit about this particular project, and I know a decent amount about Alameda Research, so I want to mention it. So Alameda Research had a, a tight relationship with a project called BitDAO. And I'm mentioning this for a very specific reason. It's a bit convoluted, but in essence, BitDAO has a short list of investors. They have a, a ridiculous amount of money at their disposal. And they uh, don't have a lot of oversight on how they're spending that money. So it's a crypto project that Suji Swap and another big cryptocurrency project, uh, Bybit, both donate money to daily. There's a record of those transactions going into the wallets. And then the, the shared treasury funds are decided what to do with by the stakeholders and bit out tokens. So if you have a certain amount of bit you can make a proposal of what to do with this gigantic pile of hundreds of millions of dollars. And essentially what that means is that the people that invested in BitDAO and Bybit and SushiSwap have control of those funds and that they can then hedge the responsibility for who makes decisions about what to do with that. They can kind of point the finger at each other and then move a lot of money around. This is important to me because when it came out that Alameda Research and FTX were going down uh, in November, this was something that came to my head immediately because the very first deal they did was with Alameda Research. The very first thing they did with their money was give a swap with FTX tokens for 100 million bit tokens. It is a really, it's an insane amount of money. Um, and I also found two wallets that owned a significant stake. Like basically, I found that I think one or two Alameda Research C level people. Um, are stakeholders in BitDAO. And those assets may have been hidden when the exchange collapsed, or they may have been a convenient way to personally uh, launder some money for you know, running from authorities. So this is still in play because these wallets are still active. They're not necessarily considered official FTX accounts, which means that the incompetent um, regulations and the incompetent uh, people that work in those departments for the US government, I don't think are sufficiently aware of some of this stuff. And that's where this gets interesting because they're still using them to move money around. You know, it's either them or the Bahamanian government. I'm not, not really sure. It's hard to say who's doing it, but this money is still in play. So. This is something I care about continuing to scrutinize because I have other information I've never talked about publicly related to BitDAO um, that concerns the identity of who owns what buttons in this project. And this is why I'm mentioning it. Rally went down. Um, so Rally, if you're unaware, is a social token cryptocurrency project that was giving creators the option to like you know, basically sell stuff to their audiences through Rally's platform. Um, Rally is always kind of dubious, technically, but they had a one of the people that they brought into their company. Actually, the one of the founders of Rally, Kevin Chu, uh, actually wrote this long blog post about what's going on at Rally, what's uh, being done with new advisors being brought into the project. And I tried to find the page here, but I wasn't able to. They had an advisor page up here. It's probably not that hard to find. I just didn't look that hard. One of the names on that list is a guy named Ronan Kirsch. And Ronan Kirsch is a very good friend and business partner with one of the people that controls and runs BitDAO. So BitDAO and Alameda had this big deal. Um, Turns out Alameda Research is insolvent and went under. 
and now we have Rally going under. And Ronan Kirsch was paid a lot of money by that project. And when Rally closed shop, they just took everybody's money and made it inaccessible. And you can't even access the cryptocurrency assets that they had given people in return for their money. So a lot of people are accusing them of being rug pull. So that's, as far as I know, hasn't come out yet. But if I remember right, Ronan Kirsch did have Rally on his resume here, and it's gone now. Um, I might be mistaken, but he he definitely, you know, worked for Rally as an advisor and received money for that. So people like this that have those funds, I'm curious, watching their wallets, what happens next, right? I'm just checking in for questions or comments so far, because I'm talking a lot more today about, like, media-based content and how it relates to the market and how it relates to you know what the what the pressures and push and pull are between different parts of the industry so it's more general i'm trying to make this like different so it's not boring um if you have any questions or comments feel free to type or just unmute yourself and i know Valhar the way asked is it possible for nick's launch investigations to a series on polka dot explorers it's possible i I've never, I, I don't feel like I'm familiar enough with Polkadot's Explorers myself to do that, but I, I can take a look. I've been kind of waiting for Polkadot to get more traffic on it to make it more of a more of an attractive target to learn how to do that. Because there's a long list of stuff that I'd like to learn, and it's all about time commitment. But yeah, that is something I'm actively watching right now. Somebody else typing, so I'm just I'm just gonna hold on for a minute. Keep typing. I'll um I'll give you a minute to to finish up your question there. So I'm just looking through what we still have here to cover from the media side of stuff. I don't know this goes back to the thing about people's reputation um, is burnable, right? You know, you kind of assume that these things are rock solid because uh, a lot of employees are willing to put their face, their name, their professional career out in public where people can scrutinize them if the project disappears and takes your money. In practice, though, when there's millions of dollars at stake, sometimes people are willing to take that risk. And sometimes there's only one person in the company that needs to take the risk or be, you know, the, the the hand that takes the money out. It's a lot of questions about what other people knew, who else was involved, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of ways to, as it, as everybody knows, companies exist to kind of hedge liability, you know. But the stuff about the charities coming to play here, very very recent information keeps coming out about what's going on with some of these charity projects because government's starting to notice that they're being used as laundering hubs. And I heavily suspect that Binance Charity, which did have a court case in Cyprus and had to exit the country, um, it's been in the press the past couple of years. I do think Binance Charity is um, at least guilty of grossly exaggerating their donations, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But they're also not really documenting who's donating and where the money's going in a way that is auditable. So. That being said, I think we've covered what we have here. Yeah. I just, I kind of wanted to point out if you want to do this work yourself, like, like if I, if I want to look at, and this is why I did the work in the first place, I wanted to look at how many of these charity projects are kind of scammy, right? And, and things like NFT marketplaces, how many of them are actually doing what they're purporting to do in their in their marketing content and things that I read on supposedly reputable websites about them. And the first thing you do is you take the wallet address and you look at how much money's there versus what websites say. Now, when I did this work back then, I just assumed that I was missing something because out of that out of that money, it was it wasn't all accounted for. And even now, Looking at this over a year and a half after I could have possibly edited that document last. 
there's there's a lot of money here that just isn't actually accounted for. So I'd have to go through and find what was going on at the time, pair it between Etherscan and BNB, and add up the totals and see how much is missing. But you know what I saw when I looked for donation activity because they do actually do this, like in the case of Binance Charity. Bring this back up. It's going to go straight to the website anyway. But they they now list specific transactions for each project, which they did before. But they they looked, if I remember, they they looked a bit different. I may be remembering correctly. I'm not sure. Um, these numbers were much higher at the time, right? So. I just wanted to know very simply how much money is each project receiving and how do you track those transactions? What I found when I looked at some of these is that when you actually look at the transaction, it's on this funny blockchain explorer. You go to the to address to see what's going on there. When you walk back these donor addresses, they come from Binance. And they're older, so they kind of look legitimate. Um, but it is the case that every every one I looked at, that that's what it looks like. And the one that I kept up was here. This is for the Binance Australia restoration donations. And these are coming from one wallet to Binance. And that's it. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. You go back here from Binance to this wallet. A little bit of time goes by. Charity opens up. And then start making the donations. And that goes right back to Binance. So you have no way to analyze from what's public if Binance owns all of these wallets at all. Um, there's no way to know without auditing Binance's books, which nobody can really do, except for Silvergate. So that's the whole you know, it looks like a money laundering ring, or it looks like so suspicious that, yeah, I'm pretty convinced that there's something bad going on there. Um, as far as running Kirsch goes, might care about it. So I actually had to take this and put it in a Google Doc to do this. So it wasn't letting me search it that easily, but this is the executive board section of. Okay, and my has this question up, so I'm gonna read it. What's your take on the state of media outlets that are covering crypto themed issues? I noticed that some are being subject to the same pressures as the rest of the industry, partly because they're funded by subsidiaries of bigger crypto firms, now being driven the ground and restructured. What does this mean for crypto coverage? Will it trigger a larger shift to social media slash Twitter, more breaking news as opposed to investigative other? It's tough to say because you can also consider that some of the people breaking news on social media are have conflicts of interest right so what i'm seeing is that companies are trying to get into the social media marketing side of breaking stories um just kind of like me too for crypto right it's it's a way to weaponize social media in order to generate attention and outrage against your competitors or deflect away from whatever you did or choose the timing strategically i'm not sure too much about what's going on there i do think with with the investigative journalism stuff, they are receiving a lot of pressure to talk more about regulations, but it doesn't sell, like no one wants to have ad buys for regulations. So it's content they're releasing to keep legitimacy and they're still having this pressure on the back end from their customers, from their company customers to like make crypto seem like a very attractive investment and make certain projects look very healthy. And it's highlighting the, the relief, the high relief between the two, right? Because it's, it's a weird job to be in media, um, especially when you're taking money from advertisers and selling, you know, selling interviews, that kind of thing. But the main example I think of right off the top of my head, you know, CoinDesk, been rumored they're going to get sold for months, and they're owned by DCG. 
And then there, of course, is the deal with, between the block and FTX, which came out. It's a huge scandal, uh, rightly so. The CEO was getting what looked like bribes. Uh, so hard to say. But I do think legitimacy in, in media is the price. Whoever can maintain legitimacy and not have embarrassing stories come out about their employees or about their company, or can at least outcompete everyone by doing the same to everybody else. That's what I'm seeing is the trend, like uh, crypto leaks and all these random people that are on Twitter doing their own investigative journalism. They get a lot of offers to do stuff um, for large amounts of money from, from these same companies, you know, on both sides, from either media or from crypto companies that don't want to be in their crosshairs because they know that there's risk involved. They want people in their corner like they want, you know, key opinion leaders to come out and tell you, you know, my name's Matt Damon and I think FTX is great. Um, that kind of thing. But yeah, citizen journalism is unfortunately the current standard, which is pretty bad. Um, so I'm hoping eventually there's money coming in for citizen journalism to do this work in a more professional setting. That's part of the reason I continuously do these calls and talk about it. It's just an unbelievably fertile ground for, um, you know, if you can do a method reliably, you can generate a crazy amount of good content that's true and provable and not subject to, in my opinion, uh, being sued for libel or for slander or defamation. That's really the chilling effect on journalism in the US. It's where a lot of the internet's based and de facto that's how a lot of media is pushed through that, you know, restrictive prism of what's not going to get us sued. And that's how everybody around the world is consuming news. It's all about liability. So I think crypto opens the door to work around those defamation risks. And things like Kevin Chu talking about Ronan Kirsch being on the payroll is pretty helpful because he still has a lot of money. He, Ronan Kirsch, um, own, is, is one of the key controllers. I don't say he owns it, but he was appointed as the basically the founder of Game 7. The fund was founded by BitDAO. Ronan Kirsch controls it. It's $750 million. You know, it's not a joke. So he was advising Rally, and now Rally is being accused of being a red pole because they shut shop and stole your money. Um, that's that should be bad for Game Seven, but a media outlet has to have the bravery to report it, and not fear running Kirsch or bit down suing them. So that's that's the catch twenty two there. I want more info on what I'm describing here? I've touched on this before, but I haven't talked about some of the relationships involved. Um, yeah, Game Seven is one of the largest crypto funds that I'm aware of that exists in crypto. And some of the people involved in BitDAO are extremely powerful. So I try to restrict, you know, name dropping some of that stuff. And now we're going to move on to my final media thing. And actually, we're going to keep that pinned and keep that pinned. So. I don't think I've ever mentioned these guys on here. Um, not that I recall, but Blockchain Intelligence Group has been putting out content for quite a while, and I've all, I haven't noticed them much. I've always known they existed. I haven't really bothered to read any of their stuff. But, but they've come out with some interesting tools. Um, somebody told me about Clue, which I still haven't, still haven't tried, but this firm is putting out good blogs, is what I'm trying to say. So they do a couple of posts about the investigations they do in crypto, and they seem quite credible. Um, I don't know a lot about them beyond that. I just wanted to mention it because when I was doing my research this morning, you know, I finally decided to read one of their articles, and this seemed like a really good proof of method. You know, it's, it seemed like they did due diligence. It's very basic. But this is talking about the war in Ukraine and how cryptocurrency transactions spiked after this stuff began to become a big public deal. Uh, they're, so they're measuring amounts moving from different charities, different donor groups, and where it's going. I think this is really 
like people that do investigations into war crimes or do stuff involved in OSN journalism where you're looking for dangerous people's money, uh, particularly people that, you know, run criminal organizations. This is where they come. They look for spreadsheets where people are moving relatively small amounts of money to, I guess, to Americans or people in first world countries, but large enough in those countries that they make a huge difference. Like the Taliban having five or 10 grand in a wallet doesn't really make me feel like it's a big deal, but it, it'll make the front page of any major media. Um, it'll make the front page of their site. And it does have an impact on regulation. Seeing a lot more tools like this too that I don't tend to talk about, but they're just cropping up everywhere now. Um, people are trying to build their own databases for labeling crypto wallets. And that's creating a situation where they are copying each other a lot of the time, uh, or just putting out subpar tools that don't really help you that much. And they want exorbitant amounts of money for them. That's why I try to limit how much I shill tools to you guys, because uh, I don't get paid, paid to do that. But I don't want to give you guys bad advice that will make you not so incentivized to do this stuff more than one or two times out of curiosity. Um, but yeah, this. This is great. Um, I'd love to see more people doing similar work and starting to do, which is kind of nice. And that's what we're seeing here. So what I want here, if I can find it, is the wallet address of this group. I don't know if I'm gonna get that though. I think it came from a court doc. Yeah, I remember this. That's why we care, right? Sometimes we can go back and then jump back forward, get the source documentation. I'm not going to waste time on that here. I just want to see if it would be a quick and easy check. I do want to look at these, though, because I, I haven't yet. Usually when I look at anything that has being officially designated as sanctioned or related to something big and malicious, I, I'm looking for the exchange that they're using as their fiat on-ramp and off-ramp. These funds are still here. They are. Okay, then we need to go backwards because that's the end of the transaction history for this wallet. So we need to go to the gas provider. We have two. I'm wondering if this is an exchange wallet because it kind of looks like one. This one as well. He's been very active, so it's kind of weird. Not active enough to maybe be an exchange, maybe a customer wallet on exchange. Let's do the dumb thing and see if we can pull something up on it. Yeah. Is that accurate? Eight two five three eight B. And this is the eight two five address. That's this one. So East Millionaire. It's the address we're looking at that's linked to a 
sanctioned Russian arms dealer. That's cool. We don't know much else. Which exchanges did it come from? Unknown FTX and Binance. That's pretty cool. Oh, I've seen these before. I know exactly what that is. Yeah. Let me check the chat here. What's the alternative strategy to building another database of crypto wallets as a tool? Depends on what you're trying to catalog. Um, in general, I think looking at very specific smart contracts that certain groups use to get the to basically to isolate a data set and get something closer to the group of people you're trying to investigate. So uh, you know things like ENS, which is just an, a specific NFT smart contract that lets you measure how many ENSs have been bought, and that's very intuitive because they're named, right? And in a lot of cases, they're owned by certain companies, so it's very easy to dox the wallets that way. That's a good example. Um, other things that I've looked at in the past that are a little more obscure, but very interesting are things like POAPs, which are not as, as common as you would think, but POAPs give you a really unique profile on a person because they sometimes tell you where a person was at a particular moment in time and the, across the globe, right? So that actually technically is geolocation data. If they were at, at an event and they receive a POAP for it, it's not a station that they were at that event when that POAP was released, or at least sometime around there, concurrent with like who else receives the POAPs. Um, and if you're going to events and farming POAPs, you can then just check your own wallet and look through the POAPs and figure out who else was there. 18 people there. I, you know, I remember eight names from those 18 people, and one of them worked for this VC. You go through those 18 wallets and you find the one that has connections to that VC that look credible. That's probably the right person. Or you, you know, do things like give them a little bit of money um, privately, and now you've got their wallet. So the strategy depends entirely on like what the scale of the database should look like and what its purpose is. And I've thought about this for things like scraping. Um, I think a lot of people are building these tools already for scraping social media posts, scraping uh, transaction data that's specific to certain types of activity. And that's what some of these wallet labels are supposed to be doing, is giving you contract interactions and behaviors. But another thing I never talk about here, because um, I don't do it this way, but you can look at times of the day, see when somebody's active, and that can inform you which part of the country they're in, or which, I'm sorry, which part of the world they're in. You know, or at least if this changes, maybe they're traveling. Maybe they're up at odd hours for some reason. And which days of the week, you know, Monday through Friday, this is clearly being done by somebody that's, this is like a job for somebody. Or this is a company wallet on the weekend, they don't do that much. So they keep regular hours. And then positioning on the globe can tell you something about when they're sleeping, which should be in general at night. Uh, and sometimes it's very simple stuff. Like I did, a, I did some work a couple months ago for profiling a VC that was a customer for uh, an analytics company. And they wanted me to analyze wallet addresses for the people that worked at that VC fund. So I did. And one of the co-owners, one of the co-founders of the VC, this is a bigger, bigger name VC project, like medium size. Um, they had posted a list of people that helped them along the way. And they did this on Twitter. They said, I'm, I'm going to send everyone an NFT that helped me along the way. And there were over 100 wallet addresses on it. And all I had to do then was figure out um, how many of them I could dox based on the network that that person kept and his affiliations that were public. And um, I found some interesting stuff that way. So if I wanted to do something specific for a market sector, in other words, I could really specialize on looking through all of those wallets until I figure out who, was it, who they all are, or I can just stick to a few, prove that it worked. And then if I ever need to come back to that data set, I can. So if I find that that person or that fund later does something interesting, that makes me want to look more deeply at them. I have a kind of a backdoor into doing that. It's the same if somebody get some website gets hacked that a lot of people use. You can look for data that way. You know. Do you have any other questions or comments? I 
curious. Um, how many people here work in the cryptocurrency industry right now versus just doing retail investment or, or learning in general? Does that feel like, like sharing that experience? Deb, yep. It's interesting to me because uh, I dedicate a lot of my time and attention to talking about the ways in which you can look at information and get information from it like you know i looked at a i looked at the treasury's website i got an etherscan wallet address and when i plug it into nonsen and google it's telling me that the ceo of nonsen is linking it to an alameda ftx deposit wallet so like if the court docs come out for the customer list or just the sheer amount of money that's in here it kind of helps you narrow down who, who it could be it might inform since you already know who's on the other end of that trade, because the Treasury Department's telling us it belongs to Jonathan Zemenkov. Uh, John Jonathan Zemenkov. It's pretty valuable information, you know. Like, where was he traveling to when he made those transactions? Did he do it in person? Does he have other node associates that weren't sanctioned that are still active, and those are their wallets? Are shell companies involved? Like, that's all stuff you can drill into if it's if there's a reason to do the work. While while we're here, net, net exchange flow for the past few months is still, as far as I understand it, to be moving to where exchanges are are less liquid. There's there's more money flowing out than flowing in, right? So we got to look at one of my favorite things to look at here is stablecoin activity, especially when Binance is freezing. You know, freezing your ability to withdraw certain stablecoins, pretty significant. This is almost certainly Coinbase. A lot of stuff going on with Tether, Tether Treasury still. That works in crypto education. What What do you get as the sense of like what the sentiment is? Because um, I notice a lot of people that I used to talk to pretty frequently have wanted to like not talk about this for a while um, because it's depressing, or or because like uh, there's not a lot of developments going on in the industry. And I, that's been kind of my experience as well. The developments are all happening in the regulatory space. So it becomes a question of how much regulatory activity do you want to monitor and is it actionable? Can you do anything with the information that's valuable? I think the answer is only if you contact those people directly and then see what, um, what they might need, right? So it's all about like market demand. What's the value of the information? If anyone else wants to talk, feel free to unmute yourselves. I want to give this uh, more like discourse and get more more feedback on what interests you guys. Like, why do you come here to listen to me talk about this stuff? Because I can easily. You do whatever suits the audience. That's, I'm happy to do that. And I do have some interesting stuff I can I can continue to work on, like Binance Charity. But that stuff falls under like regulation, less under investment. And when I go looking for price charts, I'm not going to see significant spikes in most assets unless you're buying like Coinbase shares. So some limitations to how I can apply what I know about how this stuff works, unless I go to look at things like subgraphs, you know, so we have a spike in the graph token. I can look at the graph.org and figure out what's going on there. 
but that's kind of out of the scope for I think most people here. Does that make sense? One other thing that I'm kind of curious about is is it G that's D? We still have quite a bit of this, I think, in circulation. And there's with the documentation on this as early as this morning. It seems pretty explicit that this is being verified by FDIC backed funds. And it's not super clear on uh, if those documentation uh, are, pu are public or not. It's just not a station that they exist. And circulating sp till supply is here. 571 million. Now, if we're seeing more cuts at exchanges, um, looking at assets that rely on the exchanges continuing existence are pretty significant, right? So we want to see things uh, like here's $2 million moving to, excuse me, to Tether, but that's stablecoin general. I want to stick to this. And yeah, as I, as I thought, we don't see a lot of new movement going on here. And the distribution's pretty, pretty low. All right, I was just curious, looking at different you know, you gotta go, you gotta go to where the where the action is, like where the traffic is. So right now it's in stable coins, and occasionally in some stable-ish cryptocurrency assets. Which, you know, pretty much you can do the market cap thing and say, yeah, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then go through market sectors one by one and pick things off. But for me, it's still about some of these stablecoin projects. I think are going to continue to be affected by regulatory pressure and maybe people throwing their funds in panic, which could lead to some of them uh, collapsing, notably Tether and BUSD and BNB. And um, that's something I, I'm still pretty interested in talking about. If that's something I'm talking about, like maybe more than we need to, I can move past it and move on to going to things like Polkadot Ecosystem and Avalanche and other other more niche stuff. I just want to make sure it's interesting to whoever I'm talking to. So, you know, for example, I don't talk about Tron outside of just generally, partly because learning about it kind of limits what I can talk about um, to just Tron stuff or, or Ethereum-based stuff. And it depends a lot on the blockchain you're trying to apply this to. So somebody asked me the other day, when you're doing work in cryptocurrency investigations and you're going to look at data, what do you do if it's Monero, right? What do you do if it's on um, another blockchain that's not Ethereum? The answer is, I talk about Ethereum because Ethereum is extremely adversely affecting your privacy. Um, and other blockchains, you have to do a bit more finagling. Even on Bitcoin, um, even on Bitcoin's blockchain, you have to do a bit more checking uh, and diligent work to document and then double check everything and make sure it's correct. With Ethereum, sometimes the answer is kind of staring you in the face and it's really evident. So. That's why I tend to stick to that when I'm doing these calls. But there are a lot of these things that I talk about where you can apply the same concepts and the same fundamental method to do work on any any other chain. It doesn't really matter. And sometimes if I need to do that work, I'll step away from nonsense because they, the developers mostly nonsense good for looking at Ethereum. So they're integrated chains. They're, they're pretty buggy still. Some of them don't work as well as I'd like. Um, and then I'll switch over to DBank. I can look at cross-chain interactions a lot more easily. And that's typically what I try to showcase when doing it here. Um, last thing I'd mention, which I've mentioned many times in these calls, but I haven't talked about them in a little while. What's going on with DeepDAO, I think, is going to continue to be really important because in a bear market, there's a lot less activity padding the data. So it's easy, I think it's easier to spot fake activity that's going on with DAO votes 
or with community engagement, you know, you, you shouldn't see a lot of people posting about treasury decisions that all happen to also own very similar amounts of money in the project. Um, and if you do, it's probably that their employees are maybe one of the main investors in the project, but you can, you can actually figure out which of those might be the case. So um, there's been some questions around like Uniswap, which I don't talk about because it's definitive. There's a, somebody owns enough of Uniswap to control it. But something like BitDAO, where it's supposed to be a little bit more contestable, in, at least in, in theory, you can look through some of the main token holders for BitDAO and look at the governance participation and do profiling on these votes. And I think while we're continuing to be in a bear market where investments are riskier, you're going to see them using these untapped DAO funds more and more, partly because it's a good way to keep people in the community and partly because that was the whole purpose all along. So they going to continue to bleed DAO treasuries into other things that they would like to profit off. You know, money's just sitting on chain. It's riskier to leave it there and not spend it. Render and sand, sure. You want to look at the contracts or you want to look at the communities? So we've got, I see why. I see. So I guess the question here is, where's this pump coming from? And is it organic, right? Is that a good uh, estimation? Let's start with the exchange listings just to see how much of this is exchange data. And sometimes when you see uh, token pumps that are coming from dubious sources like bots, they go through certain exchanges that are easier to you know, kind of make a lot of fake accounts on. So in the last week, you've seen an almost 8 million token spike on Binance. Render is $2 each. And that's not that different than it was a few days ago. So I'm going to estimate that that's just, so what is it, two times? So yeah, that's like $15 million, $60 million. In render tokens, that's gone onto Binance's exchange. And usually that happens when somebody's unloading them from an on-chain wallet to sell them, which means you should have a record of that. And next question is, can I profile Binance itself to see where those funds came from or what the net outflow is, who's losing render tokens. Cumberland Forwarder is a market maker, and then these guys. So these are the ones I want. I would actually want all of these because they're probably, probably correlated. These tokens are coming from Coinbase in little batches, getting put onto this wallet, and they're still there. So there's one, there's two, same pattern, there's three. Then we add the totals together. You've got what's the balance? That's my main question to make sure. 2.4, 2.4, 2 2.8. 2 maybe a token, maybe an investment round. Have they made any public statements about it? Be my first guess. Although this wallet's got a longer history from Coinbase. This looks like somebody that would have, like presumably, for example, this wallet in particular might belong to Coinbase, but Coinbase doesn't usually do this with tokens. They don't parse them into their own wallet and then not use them very frequently where they're just depositing. This is like a vesting agreement. Um, that's been parceled out and these tiny amounts make it harder to detect. So I would look at the, the pay periods and see if they correlate with investment rounds three or six months out from them. 
So there's one, two, and three. And the the offloading on Binance we saw, that's different than what we're seeing on Coinbase. So my next question would be this one. See if this is why, you know, you could just do it from Binance as well. I don't like doing it this way in calls because I have to go through Binance's individual wallets. Um, but that would be a way to get the answer. It'd probably be the quickest way to get the answer, actually. Figure out who's unloading the tokens onto Binance if it's not coming from a listing. And this, this might explain some of what you're seeing. Coming from Kraken to Cumberland Forwarder. So somebody at Kraken might be liquidating their position, or it might be coming from Kraken itself since they just fired a bunch of their employees. Maybe they're unloading some of their uh, position and render if they had one. I would check that and see if this correlates with anything else that they're doing. But that's what that is. And usually when they're unloading tokens onto the market in general, like they seem to be doing on Binance, they pump the price in advance of that because they want to unload it onto other people. Otherwise, they, lo they lose money. They crash the price as they're selling it. So they do OTC trades with the exchange. It still affects the market because um, the exchange can do some front running of their own to try to profit off of the losses they're going to end up taking. And just too many people involved to try to screw each other over trying to get out before they're holding the, the bag. So that's, that's what I'd say about render. And there's this escrow stuff going on here. Maybe I'll hold on to that. That looks interesting. Any other questions on sand, which I can do pretty quick. We're running over on time here, but. And first question, I didn't do this for Rendex. It's been going on for a longer period of time. So we're looking at sand. Are you wondering about this this pump right here from 31st of December up? I see. It's like this volume spike right here around 14th, 15th January. General outlet. Okay. So token distribution for SANS. We're going to do that from. I feel like I'm cheating when I use nonsense, but it's certainly quick. I do miss things when I use nonsense. It doesn't catch everything, that's for sure. General outlook. So ownership distribution. I have to pay this against documentation, but um, first thing I notice is um, what's the total supply, circulating supply? 1.7, so yeah, 1 billion, 750 million. Less than a dollar a piece. So we've got, so then these amounts aren't that significant as far as the whole supply goes. What I know offhand is that Nutsen must not be, be tr tracking all of the supply that CoinGecko says is circulating. I'm going to close out of these. I'm going to check EtherScan because that's going to be conflicting information. Maybe it's on different chains. I mean, CoinGecko is supposed to aggregate them, but they make mistakes. So we've got. Think about how to do this here. Three billion sand. I want circulating supply. We've got two other chains to look at. Let's check Polygon to double check. I guess nothing. Okay, so it's 
bugging out on us. So we're going to go back. I'm going to keep this strict to what's on either scan, I guess, for time reasons. I usually look for bigger amounts on exchanges than, like if Binance is the main lister, it's generally not healthy because they, um, they'll hold on to those tokens forever, but it's not a good indication of health when you see shadier exchanges in, in different jurisdictions that are probably not ideal. So like Gemini and Kraken, you generally know are probably going to have better standards or at least to other investors look cleaner, um, healthier. I don't even see Coinbase here. It's down here. Coinbase's position is pretty small. Binance's is obviously the biggest. I also look for clusters like this. Just understand who they're giving the tokens out to and if it's organic or not. Usually it's not. And since we're in a bear market, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of new fresh wallets buying up render tokens to hype the price up. I would expect this Binance account to be how they're paying their employees since it's so much. And I would look for other financial partners here that aren't disclosed by the documentation. So Genesis Trading OTC, small position, but it's not nothing. I don't see a lot here that looks like good or bad. I would look more into um, what the volume looks like off of secondary markets. So like who's using sand and why? And you would be doing that from the game. Maybe from other like sub, you know, like some uh, NFT deployed contracts that are maybe using sand. I'm, I don't know offhand if uh, that's part of how this is supposed to be working. But that's what I would do when it comes to NFT games or games that require cryptocurrency transactions to work because there are really not that many people doing it because you have to pay gas fees to do it a lot of the time. And that hampers your ability to like play the game and not be waiting 10 minutes for a transaction to clear. That would be my next stop would be looking through their documentation and then compare it to what we're seeing here for the token distribution and then check the volumes to see if it correlates with like the traffic on the gaming site and try to understand how many users they're getting. If you want to go that deeply with it, that's what I would look at like unique active users versus transaction volume and how many wallets are getting used on the game itself. And then try to figure out how much the percentage of the total supply is sitting on cryptocurrency exchanges or other secondary markets. Do you have any other questions or comments before we get going? Sure. And if you guys want more links, like if you have questions that um, I may have talked about, but I didn't spam the chat with enough links today, feel free to ask and I can, I can bring those back up. I try to not you know, I don't know if people actually click on these or, or just looking at them. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you for coming.